Joe, um, very much for that um, very warm introduction. And um, I'm very excited to be here on this on the third take of, of coming to this I4 conference. Um, and I would like to really start off by thanking, um, acknowledging um, the extraordinary work that I4 does in Osaka and in Japan in providing this kind of uh, conduit, uh, this important academic space for uh, so many of us um, around the world to be able to come and meet and to uh, share in the various delibera deliberations that we are uh, working on as academics, as scholars, as students, as practitioners, um, as teachers. Um, and so on. So I would very much like to thank um, Dr. Joe Haldane, the director of I4, and his extraordinary team, which I'll say more about the last session as well. Um, and it is true to say that um, I was at the University of Tokyo um, in the year of 2010-2011, um, and uh, saw that there, there was this exciting event taking place uh, in Osaka, and I and I thought this is a wonderful opportunity to, to actually uh, come to Osaka and to also be involved in, in the inaugural Cultural Studies Conference at the time, the inaugural Asian Studies Conference. Uh, and, and just to sort of calibrate um, what Joe said a little bit is that uh, I, I felt tremendously guilty about the fact that I wasn't <coughs> able to make that particular event. Um, for those of you who may know anything about Japanese uh, protocols and sensibilities, I felt uh, a very strong sense of, of, of not wanting to leave Japan, in fact. And I was en route to Osaka. In fact, I was in Kyoto, not far away, coming to the conference when I got an email. Um, and this, I don't know whether you've, you've received an email from your vice chancellor ever, but it was in, or maybe you have, <laughs> or your president. Um, it was in capital letters. And I've never had an email from, from a vice chancellor or from um, someone of that level in, in capital letters, and it said, leave Japan immediately. <laughs> uh, and uh, myself and a, another a colleague of mine who was actually doing research in Okinawa, which is a thousand kilometers away, we were both recalled, we both met up at, uh, in Kansai Airport that evening, and, and it was a very, very, it was a very tense time, and Joe was very, very understanding uh, about the difficult place that I put him in as well. So I feel very fortunate um, to be able to come today and to present um, this belated keynote uh, because I'm certainly not um, that kind of egotistic person who wants to do both chairing and keynoting because as anyone knows uh, doing conferences is not exactly the most relaxing thing which you could possibly want to bring on yourself so and then yes and you look remarkably relaxed <laughs> uh, so and so, I, so first of all, I just want to also acknowledge um, the fact that, as Joe said, 35 countries um, are represented in this conference. And I think that is testament to um, yourselves for making the effort to come all the way from your places of, of um, home or work to Osaka, whether you're from far away, and I think that we've got people here from New Zealand, um, my, my home country, um, from Sweden, from um, Taiwan, from Israel, from I think Uzbekistan. Um, and we have, we have uh, people coming from all over parts of Asia, Malaysia and Pakistan and India and, and in Japan as well and, and South Africa. Um, so, and I've, met, I've been very happy to meet a number of um, the delegates last night at the reception and, and, uh, and I'm just really quite struck by the fact that uh, that you've responded to the conference theme, I, I, I hope, or I understand that you may have, for this year's conference, because uh, it was something that uh, was very carefully uh, constructed in discussion with Joe um, and, and about something that was quite relevant to our times. And so I hope that you will all find this conference an extraordinarily rich nourishing, wonderful experience, um, not only in um, giving your paper and feeling wonderfully relaxed after it's done, <laughs> that wonderful feeling of, of, of being unburdened, 
um, but also that you meet people from other places, uh, that you strike up a friendship or a relationship that's um, going to you know, take, take you somewhere where you may not know for the future. Because conferences are like windows, and uh, you know, the, more, the more times you leave the window open, opportunities happen and things occur. And I think that's one of the most wonderful uh, gifts that uh, an organization like I4, which I, I understand, uh, to my knowledge, is really quite a unique organization, um, provides. It's just this extraordinary kind of scholastic uh, think tank, uh, clearinghouse, where it brings people together. And um, a few years ago, when I was um, doing my PhD, I was very, very fortunate to have a morning with um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, which was part of my PhD research, in fact. And um, Desmond Tutu had just won the Sydney Peace Prize. This was in 1999. Uh, and, as a, uh, a, and very fortunately, um, he had just made some remarks uh, that were very much about what I was doing in terms of my own research, my own PhD, which was on uh, homosexuality or gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual issues and human rights. And he had just made a statement in Brad, uh, Emory University um, a, a month before I met him about uh, the fact that there was such a thing as the apartheid of homosexuality, what he called the apartheid of, of homosexuality. And, and this was uh, a really extraordinary thing for someone of his calibre to say at that time. Um, and uh, the, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu is well known, of course, for his extraordinary bravery and courage and um, definitely one of the best recipients of a Nobel Peace Prize, I think, that we've had. But what was interesting was, when I went to interview him, was sitting on a couch with him, very nervous, by the way, extraordinarily nervous, as I was. Um, uh, and he was in his full, actually he was wearing traditional um, garb, in fact, but there he was. And he said to me, I said to him, what's the best way of, of, of having, really I was talking about conviviality, and I didn't use that terminology. I, I hadn't really started to think about conviviality or what, what it might mean to be a cos thinking about things in a cosmopolitan spirit and being so on. But, you know, we use, we, we do things often without the kind of recourse to terminology that later on becomes so um, identified in technical and theoretical ways. So I said, what's the best way for, for people to really get together to talk about things? And he said, you create an academic space in which you make it as convivial as possible so that people can talk about the most difficult things, the most challenging um, confronting issues of our times um, in a way that is free of the kind of stress that comes from other kinds of situations and to bring people together from as many parts of the world to actually bring people to rub shoulders with difference. Um, and this for me was a really uh, wonderful uh, statement to make and uh, he, he went on to talk about the fact that we need to activate scholarship in this sense. But he was talking also, also about activating human rights, which is something I went on later to, to use quite a bit in my own work. <coughs> so that's just a short preface to, to, to welcoming you and to acknowledging your uh, wonderful effort in coming to this particular conference. And I hope that during this event, over these two days, um, that we get to meet each other, because I'm not a bashful person and I love meeting people. Um, and uh, I'm I'm very interested to know uh, why you've come or what your story is and um, how you might be interested in cultural studies or Asian studies. I also want to say before I begin my um, keynote, I would like to acknowledge um, the, my colleagues who've, who've graciously agreed to be the featured speakers of this conference. Um, Professor, um, Professor Eugene Yaguchi, um, who's just arrived, um, uh, Professor Yasue Aramitsu and Professor Abe uh, as well, who have come to, to, to give the, the featured spe speeches today. So I'm very, very happy to have them, to be on, on a platform with them as well. So I just want to acknowledge that. So thank you very much. So I'm going to do, um, so as, as Joe said, because this, this, I'm in this kind of dual role of 
of chair and is also a keynote. Um, my keynote is not going to be um, sort of standard keynote. It's going to be a bit of a mix, a bit of a, uh, a mixed bag, I think. Uh, so I'm going to, to start off by... And really what I want to do is to kind of walk through one of the, some of the reasons why I thought this theme was a very important theme. Um, the theme of intersecting belongings, cultural conviviality and cosmopolitan futures. And I'm not going to theorise immensely on this, on, on cosmopolitanism, which has been rehearsed by many, many scholars and academics. And I'm sure many of you are well aware of all the different conversations about cosmopolitanism from people like Anthony Appiah um, and uh, Martha Nussbaum and Paul Gilroy um, and so on. And there's lots of people doing lots of interesting work on, on that concept. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a mix and I'll use some of a bit of a PowerPoint which is really just going to walk through some of the kind of general concepts. But I guess the first thing I want to say is that the, the, the thing that really made me think about this sense of um, intersecting belongings at this time was that last year, when I was teaching um, in my usual uh, classes at university, um, it, was, it was something that we talked about a lot in the university at that time, which was the fact that the world last year, I think at some point, um, its gravity turned towards the urban environment more than in any other time of our human history. That more people today live in cities um, across the planet than at any other time. And so, in some sense, la last year when I was thinking about this particular uh, theme, I, I was struck by kind of a moment of critical mass um, and a critical mass in, in relation to a number of things, but particularly in terms of communications, technology, of course, the population hitting, uh, it's now more than 7 billion, um, and as you may all, all be aware, that J curve, which is the population curve, which you can see on a graph, shows that human, the human population in the last 300, 400 years has just gone like that. So this this moment of critical mass where the, uh, our, our global environment has changed dramatically, that we are uh, not only in more concentrated uh, contexts, millions uh, of, of, of living, that the urban environment is now the quintessential place of human creativity um, and uh, movement of capital, movement of ideas and so on. But this is also a time which is, is also um, concomitant with the, the rapid rise of, of what technology has provided for us today. The, the role of the media, of surveillance, which Professor Abe researches so well. Um, of the movement of peoples that um, Professor Yaguchi is very um, adept about in terms of tourism. That, you know, just in Australia, for example, last year, we have a population of 20 4 million, 23 million, which is basically just part of the, uh, the inner part of Tokyo. Um, I think there's one Australia uh, actually formed every single year in China. A population of Australia is actually created. So Australia is a very small place, 23 million people um, in Australia. And so this, this, uh, it, was, it struck me that Eight million Australians were actually tourists last year. That's one third of the population of Australia went internationally um, visiting other countries. And Australia is not actually, as you probably are all quite aware, not um, considered to be in the, the uh, part of the world where it's close to, you know, <laughs> those very cosmopolitan centres. So that, that's interesting, and it's remarkable. You know, the, the, the advent of, of these things has changed the, the, the world. So there's this kind of moment of critical mass. And for me, one of the things I've been interested in for a long time as a cultural studies scholar is the question of belonging. Um, belonging and identity are two very fundamental rubrics, conceptual rubrics that we work with as cultural studies scholars, as Asian studies scholars, um, well, whatever our discipline proper may be, we are often engaged in looking at these particular conceptual frames. So there's some of the sorts of initial thoughts. So 
Contem I, I want to go on then to sort of ground this a bit more in, in, in further thought. So contemporary challenges and context. So what I wrote for the I4 site was that contemporary challenges and contexts of the local, regional, national and global raise urgent questions about cultural conviviality, rubbing shoulders with each other, coexistence in other words, uh, and cosmopolitan futures. Where is the world heading, in other words? These are times when transcultural, tran transnational, and multicultural belonging are particularly being tested through environmental catastrophe, economic volatility, parochialism, fundamentalism, notions of the cosmopolitan and multicultural exhaustion, and of course, war. A key challenge, I think, lies in the paradox um, of culture itself. Um, and those of you familiar with you know, the, the sociology, sociolog sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, um, the paradox of culture is a very rich way of thinking about the fact that we are always paradoxically in this kind of moment of going forward, perhaps, that's not the right language to use, but also, in a sense, going backwards. So for the very things that we uh, bring about to change our, our life, our world, our homes, um, can be the very traps, the very entrapment um, of our lives themselves. Um, surveillance is a very good case in point. So this paradox of, paradox of culture in which belonging has become a fundamental question of preservation, or atavism, tradition, and survival as well as hybridity, transgression, possibility and transformation. And it reminds me of Edward, Edward Said's very uh, eloquent statement that survival itself is about the connections between things. That that's what we are engaged with as human beings, in fact. And he's saying that, of course, from a very post-colonial uh, reading. It's, a, it's at the very back of his book, Cultural Imperialism. But survival is about Human survival is about the connections between things. So the aim of this conference is to respond. And many of the, all the papers that I've seen are responding to this particular thought in some way. Respond to this paradoxical challenge by opening up discussion, critical reflection, and analysis about emerging social and cultural identities that are formed at the intersection of multiple and multi-sided belongings. I think we now live in a, in a world where we are engaging with multiple uh, sites of belonging, that it takes place in, in extraordinarily diverse ways. The cultural theorist, political psych psychologist, and futurist Ashish Nandi has made the argument in his review of the 20th century that it was characterized by the empire and consumption of violence on a scale that was unprecedented tracing the legacy of the European Enlightenment thinking and values that have been dominant on the planet for the last two to three hundred years. Um, from the 19th century, Nandi suggested that violence became the marker of the 20th century through a combination of the managerialism and scientization of knowledge. So these two things, the managerialism and the scientization of knowledge. But in his reflection, he noted that, quote, and this is what I think is really pivotal, our greatest victories and defeats have not been in institutions and technologies, but in the domain of human subjectivity, in what we have done to ourselves. So again, to say it's not in the institutions and technologies that lie our greatest defeat or success. It's in, in fact, the domain of human subjectivity um, in what we have done to ourselves. So I want to sort of suggest that um, this observation of Ashish Nandi um, is, is uh, very much about how does that now play out in the 21st century, um, which, which is also, uh, in a sense, feeling the effects of ambiguous and ambivalent cultural responses as well. Nandi also argues that the combination of these two social forces, tranquilizing um, 
mass communication and passive citizenry offers limited scope for either resisting violence or building a movement for peace. So there's a critical mass that's occurred between uh, what is knowledge now, uh, mass communication, which he regards as a tranquilizing effect, uh, as well as creating a passive citizenry uh, at the same time. And then he goes on to say, uh, the politics of terror have become the reign of our times in the late 20th century. And we could say that the 21st century is very much characterized by that. Doing cultural research, therefore, is a critical activity in relation to ideas of coexistence between human beings themselves and between the human and the non-human. Over the last two decades, a conceptual rubric has emerged, as I said, that attempts to grapple with, these, uh, with coexistence in new ways. Because, of course, we've been looking at coexistence for a long time uh, in every single culture across the planet and in different ways. Uh, the concept of cosmopolitan, which comes from the, the European tradition, the, you know, from the Stoics, of course, is one of those particular ways of grappling with what, what it means to coexist. Um, and it has become one of the key frames uh, through which coexistence has become increasingly theorized and recontextualized by cultural theorists, philosophers, sociologists, and political scientists over the last 20 years, particularly. And what has been discovered more than ever is how the concept of cosmopolitanism, I would say, is full of complex tensions. Um, and so in my presentation this morning, um, I just really want to, in a sense, uh, bring up some of those tensions and do it in a particular way, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so I want to explore the value of cultural research with particular attention to the compelling uh, question of coexistence, of what it means to belong, or what is belonging. Um, which, of course, is a huge topic, and of course, I'm not going to, in any sense, do it justice this morning. Um, I will posit eight or nine theses, if I get time, on what I regard as some of the key tensions faced in undertaking such research. And these are just, uh, uh, just for us to think about, um, and they're just things that I've been toying with, and uh, attempts at understanding coexistence in this way, uh, and it may, of course, not be uh, the only way, of course. And as part of this exploration, I want to draw on my own cultural studies research into issues of human rights in Southeast Asia. So, the first thing I want to do is I want to take you actually to a gallery. So I want you to imagine all of a moment that we are now actually at, an, at a gallery, at an exhibition. And this exhibition is on the question of belonging. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gallery that is devoted to this question of coexistence. And this is being curated by myself. So of course it's unique to my view. And this would be uh, something that each of us could do very differently, of course, in, in this room. So I've put together some of the pictures from this gallery just to, to sort of provoke some of the, the questions that I've raised so far about coexistence. So as I walk through this gallery, and we'll do rather swiftly, um, uh, given the time, we can't dawdle. So, um, of course, this is something that is, is our images that for me have captured the question of the, the political crisis that's occurring in many parts of the world, particularly in the, in the Middle East, um, and that was part of the, the um, Arab Spring, which turned into the um, Summer of Blood, uh, and which, in a sense, for me, captures this whole, uh, the, the, the sort of broader questions around uh, the difficulty of coexistence in terms of religious background and, uh, and, and traditions to do in relation to the kind of effects of colonialism, uh, in relation to the kind of pressures of globalization, and of course, the kind of post-colonial environment that we find ourselves in in the 21st century. So we're not going to dawdle. I'm, I'm a bit like I've got you wearing one of those things at the moment and you're listening to me talk to you what you might be looking at. So 
In Australia, for example, this uh, image for me has been a very recurrent one over the last uh, 15 years, particularly. Um, there are, as we know, something like 220 million refugees in the world at the moment, displaced people. Uh, there are people who do not ha have uh, a home, per se, in that sense. So the sense of, uh, of, of how asylum seekers are portrayed in Australia is very much around this question of, of who are not welcome in the nation, in the country, in the specific space that is called Australia. This is a completely different part of my exhibition and needs an explanation. So we'll stay here just for a, a longer moment. Um, so what has fascinated me, or what fascinates me in this particular picture is, first of all, um, the kind of mundane representations of conviviality, for one thing, at a political level, in a global sense, um, but in which we have some very interesting kind of tensions that I think we can explore, that I'm interested in exploring. So, for example, we have King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia meeting uh, President Obama on the left, and we have Johanna Sigurd Dottir, who was just until recently the Prime Minister of Iceland. And for those of you who may know, um, the Prime Minister of Iceland, who's over on the right there, is with her female, uh, her partner, her wife, in fact. So in Iceland, we had the very first Prime Minister who was uh, a lesbian and who was in the same sex and, and got married as well. And so one of the, and here she is, for example, um, in China, in one of the state tours. Uh, she went with her wife, uh, and there's a whole discourse that we can't go into now uh, around how how what happened to her wife during that visit, because she was on that state visit as well. Uh, and so one of my questions that I took up last year, uh, at a, and I gave a lecture on this at uh, Tohoku University last year, at the Centre for Gender Equality and Multicultural Conviviality, that's a, that's a mouthful, uh, uh, I gave a talk on what would it be like for King Abdullah to meet the Prime Minister of Iceland. How would this happen? What, and under, what, under what kind of protocol would this take place? How would it be for them to meet uh, from such different traditions, from such different spaces, from such different epistemologies and different obvious takes on sexuality and uh, liberal discourse and so on, all that sort of business? This particular uh, image for me uh, brings home to me the sense of... So I'm walking you through, in a sense, everyday images that for me have, make a, a point about belonging, about the tensions of belonging, the, the tensions and intersect, intersecting belongings, and about uh, moments in everyday life. Uh, and my family, my mother uh, was in um, Aotearoa at this time of the earthquake in Christchurch, which happened before I came to, to Japan. Um, and this particular, uh, these images, this, this particular uh, place had a, has a very strong uh, resonance with me because of my, my mother, who lives in New Zealand, who visited Christchurch after the earthquake. So all of you will have similar experiences of this. The tsunami in Japan and the earthquake, and this image many of you will have seen um, at some point, for me, is in a, this particular event was uh, it evokes an experience that I had on the very day of the earthquake, which was about a con very convivial moment, um, because I was having lunch with a colleague at, uh, at, at the Kamaba campus at the University of Tokyo, just outside the campus, and uh, we were in a restaurant which was basically uh, almost destroyed. It was an old wooden uh, restaurant outside uh, the campus which was basically pretty shattered. Um, and they had been preparing lunch, so we were just about to have lunch when the earthquake happened. Uh, and so everybody's, uh, everyone stopped eating, of course, and that was the, the finish of the thing. But after the earthquake, which went for six minutes, when my colleague and I went back into the restaurant, uh, because we were at a children's table and there was nowhere to go underneath, uh, so... <laughs> We yes, always think of that, and so we're, there was yes, and uh, so when we went back into the restaurant, the, the, 
and the earthquake had, had finished and everybody was, uh, was trying to look at their cell phones, but which weren't working. And of course, people realized this was a very big and destructive earthquake. Um, the first thing that happened was the people who'd been cooking my lunch put it into a box because we had to walk home that day. And they gave us, they prepared me a lunch box to walk home um, for the next few hours. So there I was with my lunch prepared uh, from that particular event. And I thought that's a, that, that is an everyday cultural mundane moment, a very banal moment, but an extraordinary uh, expression of Japanese conviviality at a very uh, extraordinary moment. Um, here's another one which I put in here because I thought it was a very interesting one as well for me because I'm very interested in the public sphere and belonging, uh, which of course many of you are as well. Uh, and this is, this is a, uh, some of my students did some research on breastfeeding in public spaces last year. Um, around the world, and this is in Malaysia. And in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, Kayol, there have been many flash mobs. You know what a flash mob is, yes? So a flash mob is, a, is when people come together all of a sudden through the Facebook and all phones. And this is one of those flash mobs where uh, there's a demonstration about uh, the, and this is a very eco-cultural expression of, of how uh, the, you know, doing things in a natural sense, in a cultural space, in a public sphere, becomes a question of belonging um, and expression. And in Australia, again, uh, one of the things that's quite ubiquitous to Western societies, particularly at the moment, is the question of Muslim immigration, um, tensions around uh, uh, belonging, and so, and so much ignorance and so much uh, misunderstanding about uh, these sorts of questions. And so these are just all provocations. And this is the last last picture of my gallery. Um, for, for, and this is, I don't know if anyone is here from Singapore, but this is actually in Singapore a demonstration of sorts, because there aren't the kind of demonstrations that we know of in uh, Western countries. Like in Japan, it's very similar to Singapore in this respect. Uh, this is a, a demonstration for uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people in Singapore. Um, in a very famous park where uh, speech, uh, speech like speaker's corner, but it's very, it's very much under surveillance all the time. But this is a, a kind of unique Singaporean way of, of that community coming together and belonging in a public space, not as a demonstration that's overtly political, but which is a celebration of, of family, of love, of convivi conviviality. So in a way, this is also another demonstration of what I wanted to talk about. This is my final picture. Um, and I think in some ways, I kind of almost, I don't know if it's a, a utopian, dystopian, uh, but it, for me it captures an awful lot of this critical mass where we have come to, to move towards the urban in a very stark way. And the kind of implications that it has for us in terms of coexistence. Uh, and here, for example, questions of the Anthropocene, uh, the term that I used in my, my title, which of course refers to the, uh, the epoch or the age of man's influence on the world, on the earth, in the planet, that we are now in that epoch where we can no longer ignore the fact that human beings are really uh, affecting, impacting uh, the planet in a global sense, in a very uh, compact sense. I, uh, there's two, uh, and in my in my final part of this exhibition in my gallery, there are two book titles, uh, representations of books that have inspired this particular approach as well, and my thinking about this conference, um, and uh, this book, of course which is one of my favourite texts of uh, the, the great Indian author, Rabindranath Tagore, um, The Home in the World, uh, which in many ways captures the very elements of, of tensions about belonging uh, in the world, relevant today, absolutely. Uh, the tension of the home being uh, put first and the world being out uh, second. The, the, the kind of compact that exists between 
the private personal space, the subjective space of the home um, and where that might be in the world and how that's all changed now because of mass communication, because of uh, the dis displacement of our lives through um, the way in which we now live in such connected um, societies. This book, and I contrast it with this book, which is by Pankaj Mishra. Um, and, and it's very interesting to me, these two books. Tagore's book was written in 1916. Um, and it's a very interesting thing. So that's, that's um, almost 100 years ago. And, this, and, and Tagore's book, Home in the World, is now getting a lot more critical attention. Some of you may know that, that there are, there are lots of different um, uh, conferences and certain research has been done about that book recently and Tagore's ideas. In, in Pankaj, Pankaj Mishra's book, um, if you've had a chance to read it, or, uh, and I'm going to say very quickly what his, his thesis is, uh, he refers to the fact that the 20th century changed in 1905, that we need to rethink history um, completely from the point of view of the, the other history that we aren't aware of in the West, so-called, which is the fact that the Battle of Tsushima, when the Japanese defeated the Russian uh, Navy, was a, was a turning point, was one of those critical moments in modernity, um, which has not received the attention that it should have about how the world changed in terms of belonging. Because up until that point, the, the dominance of the European intellectual tradition, the dominance of the European mind of, of values and principles, uh, which has become the template in which we uh, have lived for the last two, three hundred years across the world, was questioned. Because in 1905, people like Tagore uh, people like Mahatma Gandhi, um, people like uh, Mustafa uh, Kemal and Jawaharlal Nehru, for example, uh, Sun Yat-sen, all these people were influenced dramatically by that event in 1905. And it's interesting to me that the Home in the World by Tagore, which comes in 1916, in some ways is an expression of the, the, the way in which the world is now changing um, from uh, a Western-focused, uh, completely Western-focused uh, paradigm to the beginnings of a major shift, which is now taking place in the 21st century. Um, so that's the end of my exhibition. Okay, so I hope that was all right. We did dawdle a little bit, um, but I hope that was worthwhile. So these are the... These are the key challenges, I, I think, that we face as cultural researchers. Um, and through these, this, kind of, this kind of exhibition and, and the ideas that I'm presenting, and also the papers that you're, you're presenting through this conference. So I think, for example, coexistence is one of the critical concepts of our time, uh, however we start to, do, to discuss it uh, and, and conceive of it. The idea of nation and civilization have, have come to be, become regarded at this moment in our history at a very crucial point. Um, there is, for example, the thesis that China is a civilizational uh, uh, culture in contradistinction to the Western notion of nation states. And so different ideas of belonging uh, need to be regarded in relation to China than they do in other parts of the world, perhaps. The idea of, of, the, of otherness, and Professor Aramitsu will talk about this in her paper, in her feature um, speech today, about uh, the fact that we are now, we could argue, awash in otherness. Um, we could almost argue that globalization has almost flattened otherness. Perhaps that's one of the effects of tourism, the effects of rubbing shoulders together so much. So we have this kind of paradox where uh, otherness is basically everywhere and ubiquitous, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have come to live with that otherness. The human and the non-human, this particular dynamic, is something that we need to regard with greater haste, of course. And as cultural researchers, it's something that we haven't done as much as we should do. And so this question of the Anthropocene is something 
and of course the tyranny of distance. The paradox that at this time we are, uh, are so fundamentally connected and yet we are subjectively held in like never before. Uh, so the tyranny of distance refers to multiple layers of, of uh, belonging in certain ways but also being in a sense uh, distanced from uh, the actual, the everyday, the, the, the experience, uh, the tactile, and so on. So uh, there are various theories of coexistence, of course, which I won't talk about in great depth now because I see my time is, is coming out. And I don't want to talk about this too much either because um, I think all of you will probably be very aware of what cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism as an idea can offer us um, and whether it is a utopian idea. Cosmopolitanism shouldn't be seen as some exalted attainment, says uh, Anthony Appiah. Sorry. As in national communities, we need to develop habits of coexistence, uh, conversation in its older meaning, of living together, of association. So in relation to the human and the human, the human and the non-human, this is, is become, has become very important. So what is cultural studies research? And I just want to, in a sense, uh, propose that there are certain sort of bedrock approaches to cultural studies research. Well, one of the essential drives of cultural studies is its view of culture as a primary site of struggle among structures and institutions of power, representation, belonging, identity, and subjectivity. That these things need to be considered. Cultural studies research is an expanding space for sustained, rigorous, and self-reflexive empirical research into power laden complexity of the com of contemporary culture. So it's looking into, for example, how surveillance takes place, how tourism takes place in relation to power and belonging. Cultural studies research is also very important in relation to how it has contributed to our understanding of the everyday. And Graham Turner, in his recent book, suggests that cultural studies has helped place the construction of everyday life at the centre of contemporary intellectual inquiry and research in the humanities. And that's a very important facet of what we do as cultural researchers. So I have got eight theses, and I'm hoping to go through these pretty quickly. Cultural research provides much needed antidotes to parochialism and narrow forms of belonging. That that's one of the, the, the main objectives of what we do as cultural researchers. Um, that we need to think about uh, antidotes to uh, what becomes, in a sense, uh, reductive thinking, reductive ideas about culture and belonging. Uh, and these, these ideas, for example, that I'm interested in about Raymond Panicka's uh, very wonderful observation that cultural translations are more delicate than heart transplants uh, is, is one of those things that we need to consider. But I'm also interested in uh, Upendra Baxi's idea that human rights is about uh, giving, right, giving voice to human rights, human suffering. And this, of course, is also what cultural researchers do. See, thesis two is cultural studies is appropriately positioned as a critical activist scholarship. And by that I mean uh, it is basically uh, a, 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 an approach to knowledge of, of encounter uh, that is very much around the questions of getting underneath what, what, it, what is belonging, what it means to be uh, a human being. Um, and this, this process of both cult, cult, the culture and the universal. Thesis three. Ah, this is another quote, sorry. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that one. Thesis three. 
Cultural research is about self-definition and the necessary other. So uh, that, in fact, one has to, as Ashish Nandi says, one has to relive one's self-definition as much through one's enemies as through one's friends. One needs one's enemies to define oneself and one is aware every moment that one is incomplete without them. And I won't go through this either because I haven't got time. Thesis four. Cultural research provides key ways of understanding the relationship between home and the world. So a critical cultural studies is thus necessarily global in scope and engages with planetary forms of culture, exploring different forms of cultural domination, hybridization and struggle throughout the world. Cultural studies has engaged uh, local and national cultures, global flows of culture and the impact of globalization on specific cultural sites and identities. Uh, that's Durham and, and Kilmer. Thesis five. Encounter can form the basis of relating to the world rather than knowledge. But encounters can be far more important than the exchange of knowledge. Encounter with the world is about proximity, connection, starting from the everyday lived experience. In contrast to knowledge which is gained through objective and scientific means of some kind of external mastery or position of superiority. Thesis, an example of this is Ubuntu, uh, which Desmond Tutu introduced me to, which is basically the fact that we see, it's in relationship that we, that we become human, that we see ourselves become human through our connections, through our relationships. Thesis six, belonging is paradoxical. As Hannah Arendt argued, to never be comfortable at home to resist the banality of the normative, to be attentive as if a stranger in a land yet unknown is the basis of real belonging. This is seven. Cultural research can help decolonize the home place. Seeing the familiar is strange. Rethinking established identities. Questioning dominant narratives of home and taking not taking for granted what we accept. Thesis eight, my last one and the one that I'll finish on, is the human project in the Anthropocene confounds the complexity of coexistence. Uh, we are living in a period of ecocide, uh, a time which, as I said before, is this combination of managerialism, knowledge, scientization, and in which the planet itself, um, this, 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 uh, we've moved from the epoch of leaves and trees and, and winds and seas to the urban environment and what that might mean. So, and as, uh, as this is well put by um, David Abrams, we're human only in contact and conviviality with what is not human. I've presented a number of ideas there. Um, I hope that that was of, of interest. I hope I didn't bore you with that tour of the gallery. Um, I really just wanted to establish uh, a number of, of thoughts, uh, of perspectives on, on intersecting belongings and what it might mean for us today. So I hope that in some way um, is a is a, is, a, is, a, is a useful way of starting this conference because I know all of you in your papers are investigating some aspect of these things in, in quite great detail, which I'm looking forward to listening to. So thank you very much.